Hey there, it's Liz Rohr from Real World NP, and you're watching NP Practice Made Simple, the weekly videos to help save you time, frustration, and help you learn faster so you can take the best care of your patients. So today I'm going to be talking about liver enzymes, liver function tests, hepatic panel, LFTs, whatever you call them, there's many names, um, lab interpretation, using a case study of a really common presentation that I see in primary care. I'm going to be talking about... Um, uh, when to worry, the common causes, um, the evaluation, and when to send them to GI. Um, and again, this is super, super common, so if you're in primary care, I'm sure you're going to see these, this set of labs in this case scenario. Um, so definitely check it out. Um, if you're interested in hearing more, LFTs are a really big topic. Um, they're going to be included in the lab interpretation course for new nurse practitioners. So again, if you um, are interested in hearing more about it, sign up at realworldnp.com slash labs. Um, otherwise, without further ado, I'm going to share my screen with you. So let's hop into the case study. So this is Janine. She's 42. She is a new patient establishing care. This again is not her real name or her photo. So um, she's establishing care with a new PCP from another clinic. She doesn't have any concerns today. She just needs med refills. Um, past medical history of diabetes, um, type 2 diabetes, I should say, hypertension and obesity. Um, she's a non-smoker. She doesn't drink alcohol or use drugs. Um, she has one male sexual partner and he, she has a Paragard IUD. So uh, no past surgical history or family history. She's taking metformin 1,000 milligrams twice a day and lisinopril 10 milligrams daily. Her blood pressure at this visit was 138 over 78, heart rate of 77. Her oxygen and respiratory rate were normal, and her BMI is 30. So plan. So um, I'm going to be checking some labs today. So uh, CBC, a CMP, her A1C uh, for diabetes, and then a urine microalbumin. And again, I'm going to focus today on uh, liver function tests, the LFTs, liver enzyme tests, there's many names for them, but I'll touch on the other components of her holistic care at the end. So here are the results. So her CBC, her BMP, basic, med basic metabolic panel portion is normal. Her A1C is 6.7%, so that's controlled. Um, and her microalbumin is also normal. And so here's her um, liver function tests. So when you order a, B a CMP, it's usually a basic metabolic panel spliced with a liver function test, um, hepatic panel. With some difference, with some nuances, the hepatic panel specifically has um, a little bit more information and it usually breaks down bilirubin, which is kind of important. But anyway, so here are her results. Her albumin is normal. Her alkaline phosphatase is 74, which is normal. Her ALT is 74, which is high. Her AST is also high at 62. Her total, total bilirubin is normal and her protein is normal as well. So some key points I want to go over for LFTs, liver function tests again. Um, so how many times the upper limit of normal uh, is a really common phrase when we talk about liver function tests of any kind, whether it's AST, ALT, ALKFOS, bilirubin. Um, bilirubin, I guess not as much, I don't see, but people usually talk about how many times the upper limit of normal. Is it twice, 10 times, 20 times, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and really important to look at is in your kind of holistic perspective, is, is it just one element that's high? Or um, is it like, so for example, is it just the alkaline phosphatase that's high? Or is it that the ALT, ASD, and ALKFOS and bilirubin are high? That's going to really guide your differential diagnosis um, going forward in terms of how to work them up and what further testing to do. And then again, keeping in mind if they have any comorbidity. So do they have CHF? Do they have other, um, you know, medical problems that may influence um, their liver health, right? So one overarching thing to think about when you're looking at interpreting the LFTs is, is this hepatocellular or cholestatic? And so before you roll your eyes um, or skip over, this is really important. And it's actually, it's pretty basic once I explain it, right? It's just the fancy way of referring to it, right? So this is talking about whether there's damage to the um, cells, to the hepatocytes, to the liver cells themselves. So the primary problem is from a liver cell injury. And what that means is, is mainly the ALT and the AST are higher, are the highest elements compared to everything else, whether it's by themselves, or if you also have ALKFOS elevated, um, then those are going to be um, the, the predominant ones, right? And so it's going to fall into that category. And so bilirubin may or may not be elevated in those cases. And then cholestatic or cholestasis refers to the primary problem comes from the biliary tree, the bile duct, the gallbladder, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but functionally, what that means is that the ALKFOS is the highest element, whether it's by itself or whether it's in conjunction with AST and ALT, but like in terms of like the highest upper limit of normal, ALKFOS wins out, right? And again, bilirubin may or may not be elevated um, in those cases. So that's like one kind of framing thing to keep in mind in terms of like you branching your differential diagnosis is like 
looking at how high it is above the upper limit of normal and then like what kind we're kind of talking about. There's actually a couple of other things like isolated alk foss by itself or isolated bilirubin all by itself, which I'm not going to be talking about in this um, uh, case today, but um, those are kind of the two main ones to think about. Um, is, is it coming from the liver or is it coming from the bile duct determined by um, uh, the different type of lab you're looking at. And that is not like concrete 100% uh, exactly. That's a, just kind of like a broad brush approach, right? So four steps. If you have a high AST and ALT, so number one is do they have symptoms? So this is always the question when it comes to lab interpretation. Um, did you order it because they had abdominal pain or another symptom? Or did you order it with another thing and you accidentally kind of incidentally found it, right? And then once you incidentally find it, questioning further, like, do you need to call the patient back and see if they have these symptoms, things like that. So number two, what's the pattern? Again, the pattern that I'm talking about in terms of liver function tests, liver labs, you're looking at, is it predominantly liver specific or is it predominantly like alk -foss? Which one is higher, right? And then is it mild, moderate, or is it severe? And that's really important in terms of the categorization of the result because that's going to lead you down a different, different uh, differential diagnosis paths. Um, and number four, this is kind of key for any lab interpretation that we're talking about. Is it new, stable, uh, worsening, improving? Um, so looking at, if you have the luxury of looking at their last labs from a previous PCP or they've been in that patient then in that clinic before what were their last labs when were they done and like what did they show right is this is this consistent is this worsening or is it improving or is this the first time you've ever seen it right so step one do they have any symptoms so were they symptomatic or was this incidental correct so worst case scenario is acute liver failure and so this kind of really breaks it down whatever liver lab you're looking at the worst case scenario is liver failure so it's kind of one key like regardless of what number we're talking about, it's the same signs and symptoms. Altered mental status, jaundice. Fun fact, it kind of has an affinity for the tissue type in the sclera, so you can kind of see it in the sclera maybe first. You can also notice it under the tongue and then skin. It's a whole, whole body diffuse um, yellow-orange undertone, depending on the baseline skin tone of the patient you're talking about. There are other conditions where you can have like orange um, parts of your skin, but it's not like a whole diffuse whole body one, right? So right upper quadrant pain, nausea, vomiting, and malaise, those are all kind of signs of liver failure. And then um, if you have a patient that comes into you and has kind of like, seems like they have liver disease, right? And you're checking their liver tests, you want to think about ordering an INR um, as well, because that's one of the liver kind of assessing the function of the liver, even if it's not on the hepatic panel necessarily. But those are, that's the criteria that fits for acute liver failure, uh, includes an INR of, of 1.5 or more. So step number two, is it mild, moderate, or is it severe? So the normal AST to AL, or it, and ALT, it really depends on the lab that we're talking about, but the kind of universally adopted, accepted number is about 10 to 40 units per liter. And then some say um, 20 for women and 30 for men in terms of the upper limit of normal. Um, but for all intents and purposes, I'm going to keep it at 10 to 40. Your lab may be different, but just something to think about. This is kind of all approximate, right? It's not hard and fast. Oh, it's two and whatever. But um, so yeah, so mild is considered to be up to two times the upper limit of normal. So again, like just if it's around there, a little bit more, a little bit less, like around there is something to think about, right? Moderate, so up to 80 approximately. Moderate um, is up to 15 times the upper limit of normal, right? So, like, if you're worrying about a couple points being off, like, don't worry a whole lot because you can see up to 600 um, being concerning. Obviously, everything it's really concerning, but in terms of like the worst, which is severe, it's greater than 600. So, those are the people where it's 700, 1,000, things like that, and those are very different differential diagnoses and very different treatment, right? So, you want to think about like what are like. So, do they have symptoms? Number one. Number two, do they have um, mild uh, elevations, moderate or severe. And then, um, yeah, so mild, I'm just going to break this down. So it's up to two times the upper limit of normal. So common causes that we're talking about, and this is the vast majority of people in primary care, right? Um, medications, herbs that they're taking, some over-the-counter supplements, there's like recreational drugs. You want to get a really good social history for these people. Um, fatty liver disease, uh, huge, huge, huge. Um, hepatitis B or C, and it tends to be chronic. Acute hepatitis tends to be more of a um, acute uh, reaction with a more severe elevated liver enzymes, but these ones will tend to be like low-level chronic. And I've actually found a couple of chronic hep Bs and hep Cs this way. 
Um, hemochromatosis is another one. It's an iron overload kind of in your liver. Not very common, but it is kind of one, considered one, to be one of the more common causes. And then alcohol. So the ones that are in bold, medications, uh, fatty liver, hepatitis, and alcohol, um, those are kind of like the main ones that we're talking about. Um, so, um, and then another fa fun fact is that most of the time you'll see AST and ALT will be in a one-to-one -one ratio. And if it's a two-to-one ratio with the AST higher than ALT, because ALT is the one that's more specific for the liver and AST can be from a couple of other different kinds of tissues. But if you see that in the two to one ratio, that's kind of kind of points you towards the direction of your differentials of like, is this more likely to be alcohol related? Is it more likely to be cirrhosis from hep C or something called Wilson's disease or Wilson disease it has to do with like copper uh, metabolism. So in terms of the evaluation, it's really going to center on the most common causes. There's a whole laundry list of reasons why we can have elevated liver enzymes, but in the, for all intents and purposes in primary care, you're going to be focusing on the cause, common causes and evaluating those. And then that's your kind of first pass of workup. And then once you kind of met all of that criteria and you either figured it out or you haven't figured it out, that's when you're going to consider sending them to GI. I'd recommend sending to GI actually. So evaluation, I have history starred with two stars because the history is really key in terms of uncovering um, what's behind the liver enzyme tests, right? You're going to test for hep B and C serologies. And then on the next slide, I'm going to show you the kind of algorithm workup. But just as a brief introduction, here are the evaluation things you're going to do. Getting a history, asking about medications, hep B and C serologies. Um, you're looking for more chronic hep B. So that's like the surface antigen, surface antibody uh, for hep B. Um, and uh, hep C antibody. Um, if you're interested in hearing about the hepatitis serologies, I'll definitely be happy to make a video about that. Um, iron studies is one to think about because again, you're tying it to the differential diagnosis, right? So hemochromatosis, you're going to be looking at iron and like signs of iron overload, right? And then liver ultrasound, um, that is going to be pretty important in terms of ruling out. Um, it's going to it's going to tell you that. It's, it has a very consistent finding in terms of fatty liver. It'll say, um, I believe it's uh, echogenicity consistent with fatty liver. It's typically like what the results will, will say. But then also you can kind of like put your mind at ease that there's nothing else that's kind of causing um, those liver enzymes to be no abnormal, like a mass or something like that. So yeah, so here's the algorithm here. So if you have an elevated AST and ALT, so again, this is a predominant uh, uh, elevation, even if you have Alcos and bilirubin, this is kind of like the first pass that we're looking at, and we're also looking at mild, right? So these people, if they are symptomatic, even if it's super low level and they have jaundice, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, malaise, can, they're confused, send those people right to the ER. There's no, there's no need to keep those people in outpatient, right? Especially confusion, because that's a sign of hepat um, hepatic encephalopathy, right? So if we're talking, it's less than two times the upper limit of normal, which is like the vast majority of people in primary care. You're going to look at their history. So is it alcohol? Um, uh, do they have signs of metabolic syndrome like obesity or diabetes or things like that? Um, do they have other medical problems like a CHF? Because like fluid overload can cause some liver congestion and some liver um, abnormal liver enzymes as well. Um, what drugs do they take? Um, and a kind of a quick note about drugs is that there's um, dose dependent ones. So like Tylenol is one of those main ones that you think about, right? In terms of liver injury, there's a huge laundry list, right? But there are idiosyncratic reactions, which means that it's like you've had Cipro once before and you were fine. And then the next time you had it, like you just had full blown hepatitis from Cipro, um, the antibiotic, right? So like, that's like an idiosyncratic reaction where it's like, it's not dose dependent. It's not duration. It's not the first exposure. It just kind of happens, which is really frustrating, but that's something to think about if you've got really weird labs, right? Um, and then what are the risk factors for hep B and C? So for these, if you've listened to some of the other lectures that I've, that I've posted here, a lot of labs that we look at, you have to be mindful of um, like how accurate the lab is in terms of testing. So like, for example, potassium uh, platelets, like those are not super accurate from the lab. Like there's a high risk of error. So you definitely want to recheck those. There's nothing really about that for, for liver function tests. However, you want to consider repeating those in two to four weeks, depending on, and this is not like this, this is, this is experiential knowledge. This is nothing. There's nothing in a textbook that tells you you need to do that, which is so frustrating about lab interpretation. Right. But like, typically like this is my personal practice of like, if this person seems like they're getting worse and I don't really have a good picture of what's going on, you could consider repeating it to see if it was like, was it just a fluke? Like, you know, just kind of seeing from there. But if they have a lot of alcohol use, um, there are certain drugs that could be causing it. You do whatever intervention that is, whether it's like, you know, cutting down on the Tylenol, the amount of Tylenol they're having, um, cutting down on their drinking, 
try to do that as the intervention and then rechecking them in about three to six months, reviewing those alarm symptoms, signs and symptoms along the way. So like this is a very kind of conservative, cautious approach, right? So when I talk, I, I made a, I made this in conjunction with a he, uh, hepatologist, a GI doctor, and he was kind of saying like, you know, if you find abnormal liver enzymes, you can recheck it in six months. And then if it's still there, then that's considered a chronic hepatitis. And then you can go to your next step of workup. Um, in terms of my personal practice as a primary care PCP, I feel a little bit uneasy waiting a full six months if I'm not really sure what's going on. Even if it's like, oh, okay, most likely that it's, you know, this fatty liver or whatever, whatever. He was saying like you could kind of do like assume that it's fatty liver, you know, do those interventions or the alcohol interventions, right? And then recheck. And then if you go back to normal, then fine. And then if they don't, then you can go to the next step. But again, so again, these are just kind of like side notes of your own personal practice, right? Um, so you can either recheck in two to four weeks or you can check in three months or six months. I would probably check not longer than three months myself personally. Um, and then depending on how it goes, if there's an obvious source, you can kind of do that intervention. But if there's not really an obvious source, it's not alcohol related, it's not drug use, um, they don't have metabolic syndrome, I would, I would go right to secondary testing, which is again, that first passive evaluation of is it chronic hep B or C? Is there any risk for hemochromatosis? And then doing a liver ultrasound. Um, and I did not, this is not comprehensive. I didn't list all of the possible reasons you could have those mild elevations. However, in terms of the primary care guidance, this is the first pass of uh, the most common causes. And once you get to the second, um, kind of second tier, other, co other causes, I really recommend that you send those people to GI to do those workups because th that those are things like autoimmune disease and Wilson's disease. Like you're going to be ordering like ceruloplasmin and anti smooth muscle antibody. Like you don't want to be ordering that stuff. I don't know. You can, you can choose to do that yourself if you'd like to, but I would recommend as a new grad that you send those people to GI for further assistance with the workup. Um, or you can do it in collaboration with a GI and just call them and say, like, what labs do you recommend that I do? Do you want to see them or do you just want me to do those labs? Like I kind of, I kind of spoke about in the uh, CBC uh, lecture about cold calling specialists. So really up to your personal discretion, but yeah, so that's the mild workup and this is the really common one, right? So um, uh, yeah, so if it's still high, you're going to, you're going to kind of order those labs and that's up to your determination if you want to check those right away or if you want to wait and see if you can fix them first. So let's uh, just recap with Janine. So she's 42, uh, new patient. Um, most likely she has fatty liver, right? So she has risk factors of obesity and diabetes. So um, the plan is going forward is to discuss this with the patient, just give her a call and say, or have her come back in for a visit and say like, listen, like here are the options, right? So we can try to improve the diabetes, work on weight loss, see if this goes away. Or we can kind of like do some further tests to make sure that it's not, again, the hepatitis, um, hemochromatosis, you know, do an ultrasound, things like that. Um, I'm going to request um, the previous uh, records from the previous BCP to get some more kind of information to kind of compare it, compare it to previous labs that she had had before. Um, I'm going to have her come back for a physical and talk a little bit more about diabetes. And then, um, yeah, just following up every three to six months uh, is a kind of plan going forward because that's just kind of how I um, work with patients who have diabetes um, every three months until they're controlled and then every six months after that, and depending on their health literacy and how uh, comfortable they feel. So that's it. Um, did you like this video? If so, hit like and subscribe and share with your NP friends so together we can reach as many new grads as possible to help make their first years a little bit easier. Um, you sharing really does make a really big impact in terms of uh, helping more people, so I really do appreciate it when you do. Um, and definitely leave me a comment below. I'd love to hear your thoughts about um, what you see in primary care, um, if you see this kind of case a lot, um, or if there are other questions that you have about LFTs, other frustrations that you have. And definitely if you're interested in learning more about like the full range of LFT interpretation in primary care, definitely sign up for uh, the interest list at realworldnp.com slash labs for that lab interpretation course for new nurse practitioners. It'll be talking all about LFTs, CBC, um, BMP, all of that stuff. And don't forget to head on over to realworldnp.com for the ultimate resource guide for the new NP. You'll get um, these videos sent straight to your inbox every week with notes from me, uh, more patient stories, helpful insights, and uh, other bonus content that I just don't share anywhere else. Thank you so much again for watching. Hang in there and I'll see you next time.